Hey guys, welcome to Crypto TV. I'm your host, Ornella Hernandez, and today we're going to talk about two hot topics in the sector right now, Bitcoin's bullish movements and our favorite prisoner, Sam Bankman-Fried. Let's get started. The criminal trial of FTX founder and CEO Sam Bankman-Fried continues this week with Bankman-Fried himself testifying as part of his defense. He is the last witness to take the stand after more than three weeks of court testimonies. Let's see what he had to say. But first, I want to share a funny image in the spirit of Halloween week. You guys know the Grinch, right? The character from Dr. Seuss's holiday classic, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Well, I saw this in the Milk Road newsletter today and I just had to share. It's Sam Bankman fried as the Grinch. According to the Milk Road, they have a lot in common. They both steal things. The Grinch stole Christmas and well, SVF stole everyone's money. They're both mean and cranky and have hearts two sizes too small, as the story goes. And then, of course, they also made fun of Caroline Ellison, the former CEO of Alameda Research and SPF's ex-girlfriend. Here she is as Snow White and the seven balance sheets instead of seven dwarfs, since she recently testified that she created seven alternative balance sheets for Alameda Research. She said that she was trying to make the company look less risky to investors and lenders so that they could get more money. And as Milk Road put it, like Snow White, Caroline was just a girl looking for love, but got a poisonous apple instead, aka SPF. Okay, this is all pretty funny to me, but what's not so funny is Bankman Fried's testimony so far. He denied knowing why FTX began moving user funds from a bank account with Alameda Research to North Dimension, an alleged shadow entity used to launder cryptocurrency exchange clients' funds through Alameda that Sam Bankman fried claims to know nothing about. He's basically blaming everything on his lawyers and his former chief regulatory officer, Dan Friedberg, who provided him with the documents to set up the company in the first place, which Bankman fried signed without question, he claimed. And the former CEO also suggested that Gary Wang, FTX's former chief technology officer, had been partly responsible for trading with a negative balance. So this basically gave Alameda Research's fund the ability to trade more funds than it actually had available. At the time, I wasn't entirely sure what was going on, said Bankman Fried, regarding Alameda's line of credit. I thought the funds were either held in a bank account or sent to FTX in stablecoins. If Alameda had held them, I assumed it would be reflected as a negative number on FTX. Bankman Fried's claims contradict in part or directly the testimony offered by Wang and former Alameda CEO Caroline Ellison. Wang testified on October 6 that he and former FTX engineering director Nishad Singh were following direct orders from Bankman Fried. And Ellison testified that she had wanted to resign as CEO, but Bankman Fried asked her to stay, citing the risk of rumors about the company's financial health. This week, things got worse for Bankman Fried when the cross examination started. And who asked the tough questions? U.S. Assistant Attorney Danielle Sassoon. The publication Axios summed up that Sam was hammered on the stand. Crypto reporter Laura Shin said that he was murdered by Sassoon before she then metaphorically stabbed SBS dead body over and over again. These are fitting terms to be used during Halloween weekend, but a nightmare, no doubt, for SPF. Sassoon brought up screenshot after screenshot and tweet after tweet to challenge nearly every attempt that Bankman Fried made to explain away his actions in the lead up to FTX's collapse. She attempted to discredit Bankman Fried's testimony that he had acted in good faith by talking about FTX as safer and more transparent than other exchanges. She also called Bankman Fried a storyteller who skillfully persuaded investors and customers to funnel money into his company, referring to repeated instances in which Bankman Fried publicly touted FTX's innovative technology and its commitment to user safety. Were you proud that FTX got on so quickly? asked Sassoon. 
SPF replied, yes, I was. Then she asked, you made the decisions as CEO, didn't you? SPF said, I made some of them. Sassoon asked, do you think you're a pretty smart guy? Bankman Fried replied, in many respects, not all. So by focusing on Bankman Fried's past public statements, her strategy was to show that he was misleading the public about the true nature of his company's financial ties, and that FTX's sister company, Alameda Research, was not subject to the same trading rules as other accounts on the FTX platform, and that Bankman Fried concealed that privilege from the public. The problem is that Bingman Fried has provided largely vague answers throughout his testimony, often claiming that he does not remember conversations or statements he made in the past. Most of his answers were variants of, I don't remember. So his grand defense so far has been based on his poor memory. Apparently, Judge Kaplan has intervened at least twice to order Bankman Free to stick to yes or no answers and to stop trying to undermine Sassoon's efforts. This trial is soon coming to a close and the closing arguments are expected later this week. We will see what happens and what the jury decides. This is the drama of the century, folks, at least for the industry. The lines outside of the courthouse every morning are not just full of journalists or members of the press, but of random people interested in the case, spectators who are willfully deciding to spend their free time watching this trial. Arguably, these are exactly the people who are the most akin to the jurors who watch this trial play out. I wonder what they think. And now moving on to another topic, the Bitcoin resurgence. Within the last week, the value of Bitcoin, BTC, has experienced a significant advance, surpassing the $34,000 mark for the first time since May 2022. And it seems like this bullish Bitcoin movement may not be over yet. There are investors saying that Bitcoin is ending its current bearish cycle and is in an accumulation phase, about to start a new bullish cycle. Could this truly be a phase before the long-awaited crypto market boom? One big reason for this rally is the possible approval of a Bitcoin spot ETF in the United States the first quarter of next year, 2024. Most people think that this is a done deal for BlackRock and other institutions. Another reason may be the upcoming Bitcoin halving, an event that has historically caused a pump in prices and people are getting ready for it. Investors and crypto miners are looking forward to the halving in April of next year, hoping that the bull run will start then since in past Bitcoin cycles it has. So we still have around 200 days before the party starts. Bitcoin and Ethereum are highly correlated. So Ethereum has also rallied alongside Bitcoin, albeit in a more moderate way. Although ETH does not have the same media attention as surrounding BTC, it cannot be denied that there is a contagion effect influencing its price and value as well as that of other cryptocurrencies, which tend to closely follow the so far mostly positive movements of Bitcoin. The general enthusiasm in the cryptocurrency environment reflects a real demand and a reconfiguration of the market. So it's time to pay attention to the crypto market friends and prepare for future movements, be they high or lows. And it is precisely in these times of turmoil crises on a global scale, from banking crises to wars, that Bitcoin can emerge as the preferred store of value. Additionally, amid growing concerns about global inflation and currency devaluation, investors may increasingly turn to Bitcoin as a hedge against these uncertainties, similar to how they do with gold. What do you guys think? That the crypto winter is over and that spring is just around the corner? The truth is that the halving of Bitcoin is an important moment, so we will soon see if it will mark the beginning of the biggest BTC bull cycle in history. In the meantime, however, let's welcome a guest to Crypto TV, Eddie Haddad, developer and co-founder of A Layer One, currently on the testnet. Today we have a special guest on set and his name is Eddie Hidata. How are you today? Thank you, Anela. All good. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So Eddie is the co-founder and CTO of Power Labs or PWR Chain. 
Correct? Yes, we are building <laughs> the power chain, PWR chain. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. Um, tell me where that name even came from. <laughs> it honestly just came out of the idea of power back to the community or power in the crypto mm. space. So we were like, power chain, but okay, that sounds nice. It honestly didn't take much time. In two, in two days, we decided on the power, on the name. We were like, power, okay, good enough. Power chain, <laughs> done. <laughs> Easy enough. All right, so Power Labs is a new layer one blockchain and it is currently on the testnet soon to be live on the mainnet next year 2024 correct so what was the mission behind the platform what was the vision what are you guys trying to accomplish over here the vision and mission is to push blockchain infrastructure more specifically public decentralized blockchain infrastructure and cryptocurrency finally to the entire world because since Ethereum, we've honestly had two innovative, uh, I would say, phases in crypto. The first was Bitcoin that introduced the uh, concept of a public blockchain and decentralized cryptocurrency to us. And the second was Ethereum, which introduced smart contract development and development on the chain. Yeah. Uh, ever since Ethereum, we haven't had much innovation in the space that, allow, that would allow global adoption of blockchain technology. We've all been revolving all around the same technology. Even the other projects that try to do parachains or others, they're based around this same concept of a one virtual machine like Ethereum. Okay? Everyone's based around that concept. And we've already seen that that concept doesn't give us enough development flexibility. It doesn't give us cheap enough transactions. And it doesn't give us much uh, scalability, which has been limiting the crypto space from mass adoption. So the vision is to solve all of those, to create finally, since Ethereum, I would say, the first ever chain that works on innovating the, archi the architecture of blockchain technology to allow the mass onboarding of institution and retail. Okay, so mass adoption is, is the goal. The goal. Then. Final goal. Sorry for I speak a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no worries. So then how is it so different from Ethereum, like you say then? Why, why is this chain unique? To put it shortly, the power chain moves away from this concept of a one virtual machine. It separates validation from processing. The validators on the power chain, they do not waste their resources processing every single smart contract and suffering the bad development of bad developers. Okay. So they only take care of the blockchain. The blockchain itself is just a blockchain. You don't build smart contracts on it. It's an infrastructure layer that gives you all the properties of a blockchain. On top of it, you can have an infinite amount of protocols, applications, and virtual machines that you can do with whatever you want. So you have the base layer, a validation layer, and on top of it, you have unbound development flexibility to build whatever you want, however you want, using any coding language and any framework you want. You're not limited in any way. So it offers the same level of development flexibility as the internet. Okay, and so what are some of the use cases that you imagine being built on this chain? So we've already seen the current existing blockchain infrastructure being utilized in financial use cases. Mm -hmm. The power chain for will, DeFi, for exactly example. for yeah. decentralized finance. The power chain will allow for even more advanced financial applications because it has more flexibility and capability in development. So you're going to see things like forex trading. We've already partnered with a company that's building a f the first ever forex trading platform on blockchain. Mm -hmm. You're going to see more advanced decentralized exchanges that offer the exact same experience as a centralized exchange very smoothly without the need for many transactions and latency and all of that. Furthermore, we expect to see it a lot in the, I would say, data management sector. We already have mm. big data companies building with us, insurance companies building with us. The power chain is also a, suitor, a perfect infrastructure for access management and uh, team management. And the, the truth of it is, because of its development flexibility and the properties of blockchain it offers, it is suitable for all currently existing Web2 use cases. Everything that currently exists on Web2, or most of it, can migrate over to Web3 to gain the properties of a blockchain technology, transaction records, validity, uh, decentralized ownership. All of it can actually move. So it's hard to tell all of them, but these were the ones that we've originally just uh, started with and moving forward with. We're also, uh, I forgot to mention real estate. We're already partnering with a real estate investment trust out of Dubai. Is that for tokenization? Tokenization of investment in their real estate investment trust. But there's also event management and ticketing platforms that are building on the power chain. So when you give developers development flexibility, they will mm. unleash their talent. You don't need to tell them what they can build. They will surprise you and build everything on top of it. Soon we'll be seeing games, messaging platforms, social media platforms, everything. Okay, so you are a developer who's been in the space for quite some time. Yes. So can you maybe give us your perspective on how 
it's evolved for developer, how this space, the blockchain Web3 space has evolved for developers? Has it gone better? Has it gone worse? Like, what's your take? So sadly, I have to say, since Ethereum, there hasn't been much improvement in developer experience mm. because uh, there's a lot of EVM forks right now. So the developer experience for EVM is the same thing still. And we had new development experience introduced through WebAssembly machines, Solana, EOS, and others. But in both, users are still limited to a certain development language for smart contracts, for to certain uh, tools and libraries to interact to the blockchain. Even if you want to build your own uh, parachain or side chain or all that, you still have to stick to certain coding languages and certain frameworks. So okay. sadly, it's still very limited for developers and not very powerful compared to Web2. But why is that bad, though, to have like Templates it's bad because like <laughs> if we if we compare it, for example, with the developer. current uh, with the current Web two world, when someone yeah. wants to build a company, they can have a JavaScript developer and the Java developer and the C developer all working together. They can have their backend built in Java. Then a C developer comes, build a second uh, separate section of the backend, and he can link it easily with the other Java. You can build in any coding language. You can be a developer of any kind, build in any coding language, mm -hmm. and you can still use the internet and existing protocols for your application to communicate with others. Okay. On blockchain, you build on Ethereum, that's it, you're done. You can interact with applications on Ethereum. There is no proper way to interact with other applications. And you're very limited. So if you want to build on Ethereum, you have to specifically get a Solidity smart contracts developer. And on the back end, you can be a bit more flexible. But on the smart contract level, for example, you need specifically a Solidity smart contract developer. But in the Web2 world, when someone has an idea, a founder has an idea, they say, I have an idea, let's build it. You can build it in any tech stack. Right, you're right. not limited. Was there like a moment or maybe a memory you have that maybe like you said, okay, I need to do this. Like what caused you to say like, so, I need to build something for myself? So same thing with crypto. I'm, I technically use blockchain for everything. I was saved by blockchain. I come from mm -hmm. Lebanon. Well, by, the t well, by the time I was turning 18, by the month I was turning 18, we had a nation nationwide banking crisis. So right. crypto has been my bank ever since then. And I would love to utilize the blockchain infrastructure for everything I do because it's trustless, secure, decentralized. I don't have to trust anyone. I don't have to fear anyone. I can be free and do whatever I want. And we all love this sense of a freedom and ownership. But sadly, we, there hasn't been much innovation in the crypto space. I want to be able to do blockchain, use blockchain for everything. But you guys, all these big known names and big known investors and big known developers, you all promise no one is delivering. You're not really giving us a better experience. Our experience has been the same. Who's us? The community, the crypto community in general, not only the developers. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single user that comes into crypto for this freedom, uh, freedom of ownership, freedom of transacting and all of that, they haven't been given a better experience. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do it myself. You want something done, right? Do it yourself. <laughs> okay, okay. I love that. All right. So it means financial freedom to you. To everyone. No, not, not, not only financial freedom, blockchain can be used in all sectors to counter corruption. If you have your voting system done on blockchain, you cannot fake it, okay? unless you hack your, your people. That's the only way to fake it. If you have your government's financials on a blockchain, mm. they're trackable. You cannot, ha you cannot easily have a corruptible government because you'll easily start detecting the corruption. So, and on top of that, in, in crypto is not a central bank. No one can stop you by a click of a button. And that's the main reason why we all joined, because we are all afraid of governments and we have the right to be afraid. We want a sense of a freedom and ownership over our own software. We don't have, in other words, gods, about humans playing gods above us. <laughs> that's to simply put it. The, re the main reason why we all started with crypto in the first place, why we all went there in the first place. We want freedom. And I want freedom in all sectors, not only to just have Bitcoin and be able to send and receive. I want to be able to participate in financial applications. I want to be able to buy my insurance through the blockchain. I want to be able to do everything through the blockchain, which, which gives me my freedom, helps fight corruption, keeps everything running securely without having to depend on anyone. That's the beautiful, about, that's the beautiful thing about blockchain, that for the first time in a human history, since the dawn of humanity, you can have trustless transactions. For the first time, if I want to send money to someone, I don't have to trust them. I don't even need to know them. If I want to borrow from a lending protocol on the blockchain, mm. I don't need to trust anyone. The code is the thing I trust. For the first time in human history, you have trustless transacting, which is a huge philosophical aspect. It, it's a huge chain, change to human life, but not many people talk about it. But how can we have so much trust in these, these so-called trustless applications if there are still so many scams and frauds and phishing attacks going on on the daily? 
That's the thing. Those are scams and frauds and phishing attacks. They're not the applications themselves. Okay. So applications, if you're a developer like me, you open an application, you understand what's going on, you can immediately tell if this is something legit. Like you can check the code, see, okay, this is good. It's right. audited. It's but this, you that. do that, not the exactly. regular average Joe. <laughs> so what I, what I would suggest, this is something that is required not only for the Web3 space, but for everything because scamming is something spreading very wide, even in the traditional space. Yes. What I think is now necessary, because the internet is a part of our life similarly to water. Okay? Now, water, you don't need to teach kids how to drink water. It's very simple. But you need to teach them math. You need to teach them how to read and write. So similarly, I think education or education to the basics of development and how the internet works can help everyone easily detect these scams and phishing attacks. Mm. So simple education to the masses to this thing that's now part of our life, similarly to language, similarly to mathematics, similarly to everything, it must be taught in its basics to uh, allow users to easily detect those stuff and prevent them from falling victim to these scamming attacks. Okay, and then how would you rate the crypto community? It's like, as, as a general thing, I know we have like the NFT culture, people say it's full of crypto bros, and then we have like, Mm, TradFi guys turned yeah. DeFi guys. So, <laughs> the thing is, I like to speak the truth. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna sweet talk anyone. The crypto community has been sadly driven mostly by greed. Okay, everyone's been in, oh, there's this shit coin, let's jump on it. There's this NFT collection, let's jump on it. Why did people jump on NFT collections? It was purely making profit. It was not changing their lives in any dramatical way. It was not contributing to the innovation of the human life. It was not doing anything specific. It was purely for money. And People have been coming to crypto. When we first started in crypto, we were coming because we needed this financial freedom. Right. Now everyone is coming because they want to jump on the trend. They want to have a chance at gaining this profit. And that's understandable. There's investors out there that want to make money. But us as a basic community, we should stick to the values we started with mm -hmm. and improve this technology to improve our lives with it. And sadly, we have lost such values that we want to use this technology to improve the world, to improve our lives, to improve our, to improve our grandchildren's life. Everyone's become so greedy. Every single project that's being launched nowadays, all the new layer ones and layer twos, yeah. they're pure scams. With all due respect to all of them, of course, <laughs> they're not all pure scams, but with all due respect to everyone, everyone's been using the same exact technology, launching the same exact thing, promising different and different stuff just to take money. And mm -hmm. they're all trying to scam from a little community which we have. Okay, the crypto community is now small. No one is looking at the global vision anymore of onboarding everyone. No, 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 we have the small community. We're going to fight over it. We're going to drain it of more liquidity. That's why, because I'm going to say this because I've been on calls with many investors, whenever I try to introduce a project to them, no one asks anymore, what's the technology and what can it offer? They're like, what's your liquidity and community? Mm. And I'm like, my liquidity and community is not like that of the current crypto space. My target audience is now global. My target applications are now different. I don't have to fight with others over the same existing target applications. I already provide a better playground. They will migrate with time, but I also have much more applications and much more users to onboard right now. As I said, we separate validation from processing. We use a new signature protocol, which mainly allows us to scale. I don't want to get too technical, not to bore <laughs> you, but look into it. Elliptic curve signature algorithm is the main reason why we've been limited in the crypto space in terms of our scalability, and it's no longer quantum secure. So we created new algorithms based off hashes, which allows us to be quantum secure and highly scalable because all our hardware since the 80s handles hashes very properly. We improved the transactions and Brock's protocol as well as consensus. So we, we changed the concept of development on blockchain. We changed the concept of signatures and we improved the other ones that we didn't change. So that's mainly we changed and we improved. Okay, everyone's, I'm not entirely sure to be honest what everyone's doing because I look <laughs> around, they're all launching an EVM and using fancy words like ZK or I this too or many layer words. And the thing is, when I look into them, ZK is an interesting concept if you know how to yeah. use it. But I look at them, they're not, what, what are you doing? You're using the word ZK. <laughs> you're, not, you're not using ZK. You're using the word itself only. You're barely using a fraction of what ZK can offer you in the space, what it can contribute to you. Okay, so then how do you envision maybe uh, the future of blockchain in a way like how would you like to live in a world where we use this technology on a more daily basis and don't even realize that we're using it what kinds of use cases would you use it for I let's start with the small use cases then move to the big ones okay. I would love to wake up in the morning go buy a coffee for example pay for it with crypto I need uh, mm -hmm. for example I have an investment I want to deposit this crypto and borrow against it this crypto I want to be able to do that with two buttons 
click of a button. I don't want to have to fill out a form. I don't want to have to do this and that. I want to be able to transfer, for example, I want to be able to hire someone that lives on the other end of the world and to transfer money to them without having to file a 10-page report on why I'm transferring and provide all my legal documents and provide all our contracts <laughs> and waste two days of my time just to set up with the bank for them to understand that this is an employee. Yeah. I want to be able to invest with someone without also having to tell the bank why they should allow me to transfer my own money. <laughs> why you should allow me to touch my own money. Right, we need permission money. to do that. Exactly. Yeah. I, I want to have full financial freedom. That's one. I want to be able to access every, every global service from my home without any intermediary, without the need to trust anyone. I just open my phone, go to their application or website, look at this, connect my crypto wallet, sign my transaction and done. Me too. I don't want to have to <laughs> trust anyone and waste. Right now, I've, I've been trying to open a bank account here in the UAE mm -hmm. for a year. <laughs> It's always more legal paper is required than more legal paper. And the thing is, I have work to do. I cannot just keep going around getting you legal paper, people. I know. So every I know. month, I can maybe go get you one legal paper when I have free time or something. Too so. much bureaucracy. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I want those things too. Well, we are running out of time. So how is the best way for people to get in touch with you, reach out with you, learn more about Power Labs? I would say the best way is to join our public Discord or Telegram community. I'm more available on the Discord community because I'm more of a Discord user, to be honest. Uh, so I say go to our website, powerlabs.io, pwrlabs.io, not powerlabs. And in there, you can find links to our public Telegram and Discord community. If you join our Discord community, we're doing most of the testnet management in there. So if you want to run okay. a validator node, you have to apply through there. If you're a developer, we can give you more support over there and you can join the developer community. Uh, so that, I would say, it would be the best means of getting in touch with us uh, regarding the power chain. Regarding other stuff, <laughs> uh, we've honestly don't got much, much time for other stuff. All our focus is right now on the power chain, but Discord is also still the place for that. Okay, amazing. Well, thank you so much for your Thanks time Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And everyone else, please stay tuned for the crypto market update coming up next. In the crypto market, BTC's price is approaching $35,331, ETH is hovering around the $1,833 price point. Sol holders are winning today, it's up by 5.59% today, trading at $43.19, and Cardano's ADA is also up nearly 10.5% this week. That's all for today. Thank you for tuning in to Crypto TV. Make sure to give this video a like and check out other Web3 TV coverage on our page. See you guys later.